Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 711 for July 1st, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. I got to experience something that I'll never, I'll never have anything like it. I'm one of three people that swam around the coast of Isla. It's still a struggle for me to even go articulate probably what that means. Last year, Beam Suntory brand ambassador Johnny Mundell joined Justin Fornal and Chad Anderson on what could either be a whiskey explorer's dream expedition or a nightmare, an eight-day swim around Isla. The whiskey they collected from Isla's distilleries in a 30-gallon barrel during the swim is now being sold to raise money for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution that's the nonprofit organization that provides lifeboat services all over the UK and Ireland. I'll talk with Johnny Mundell about his life changing experience. That's coming up later on, along with the calendar of events, your voice, behind the label, and in the What I'm Tasting This Week department, my tasting notes for the Great Isla Swim Blended Malt Scotch Whiskey. It's all just ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. A month ago, the ringleader in Kentucky's Pappygate case was sentenced to 15 years in prison on June 1st. Gilbert Toby Kurtzinger went straight to prison from the Franklin County Circuit Courtroom in Frankfort that day, after pleading guilty to stealing thousands of dollars worth of whiskey from the Buffalo Trace and Wild Turkey distilleries. But realistically, there was never any chance that he'd serve that full sentence as a first-time offender, as Prosecutor Zachary Becker hinted when we talked with him after the sentencing. He might uh, seek to file what they call shock probation um, that he'd be eligible to seek after serving 30 days. That's exactly what happened on Friday. Judge Thomas Wingate granted the motion Kurtzinger's attorney filed for shock probation and resentenced Kurtzinger to probation for the remainder of his sentence after serving 30 days. Kentucky is one of the states that allows for shock probation, which is designed to scare a first-time nonviolent offender into good behavior. Kurtzinger could be sent back to prison if he violates the terms of his probation at any point. He is the only one of the ten people indicted in connection with Pappygate to serve any time behind bars. It should be noted that Kurtzinger continues to maintain that he did not have any role in the 2013 thefts of around 65 cases of Pappy Van Winkle whiskeys from a Buffalo Trace warehouse. And he suggested in a new Bloomberg Business Week interview released this week that there's no proof that whiskey was ever stolen in the first place. He also claimed in the interview that his bourbon stealing started in 2003 when his boss at Buffalo Trace wrote him a pass to take barrels of whiskey that didn't meet quality standards past security. We have asked Buffalo Trace for a response to those allegations and have not yet received one. However, based on the routine no-comment responses from Buffalo Trace on just about any Pappygate-related question over the last five years, it'd be a good guess that will not change this time around. And by the way, there is also an update on the fate of the stolen whiskey seized as evidence. Prosecutor Zachary Becker has filed a motion with the court asking to have the barrels and bottles of stolen whiskey returned to Buffalo Trace and Wild Turkey. Both distilleries have indicated they plan to destroy that whiskey because they can't guarantee its quality or safety. A hearing on the motion is set for July 13th in Frankfurt, 
And Judge Wingate is expected to disappoint the Pardon My Pappy fans who had been hoping the whiskey could be used for a charitable purpose. Since this episode is coming out on July 1st, which is Canada Day, let's also update the status of the Free the Whiskey campaign in British Columbia. Back in January, BC liquor agents raided the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's four partner bars in the province, Fett's Whiskey Kitchen in Vancouver, the Grand Hotel in Nanaimo, and Victoria's Little Jumbo and the Union Club of British Columbia. They seized all of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottles in stock at those bars and cited them for illegally purchasing the whiskey through the two privately run liquor stores in B.C. that carry the Society's whiskeys. The reason? Provincial policy requires so-called hospitality license holders, bars and restaurants, to buy all of their beer, spirits, and wine exclusively from the province's liquor distribution branch at full retail prices. The controversy over the seizures, along with years of pent-up frustration over British Columbia's liquor policies, led to Attorney General David Eby ordering a blue-ribbon panel to review the entire provincial liquor distribution system. Eby's ministry oversees both the Liquor Control and Licensing Branch, which regulates liquor sales, and the Liquor Distribution Branch, which operates the province's own retail outlets, as well as the wholesale operation. That panel's report has now been released and includes 24 recommendations for streamlining the system, including one to allow hospitality license holders to buy directly from private liquor stores. The cases against all four Scotch Malt Whiskey Society partner bars are still pending, but Fett's Whiskey Kitchen co-owner Eric Fergie is hoping this report will help resolve that. That's the message in the report. So we're hoping that the uh, that the government follows suit with that and does allow us uh, a broader spectrum on on purchasing our our spirits and, and wines and beers. What would that mean for you in terms of being able to? Well, that was essentially would legalize the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society stuff, right? It most certainly would legalize that. Uh, although it's. Uh, uh, legalizing is an odd word to use. This is a, a policy uh, that the government has as to where we we are able to purchase our uh, our product from. So a law uh, requires legislation to change. A policy requires a bureaucrat uh, and or elected official to say, okay, uh, this policy has now changed. So theoretically, the premier could change this with a signature on a piece of paper. Actually, general manager of liquor control licensing can do that. But yes, the attorney general certainly can. The general manager of liquor control licensing has the uh, has the ability to allow any individual licensee to purchase product from any particular place. But in the history of the liquor control licensing, they've never granted any person or, or sorry any business the ability to purchase their product from anywhere other than a government liquor store. And that's where we have this big conflict then, right? And that leads us to today, yes. What have you been told about whether any of these recommendations might actually be enacted or policy changes might be taken care of? We have, uh, have not heard as to whether any of these, uh, these policy changes uh, will come into effect. But in saying that, there is no reason for them not to put them into effect. We wouldn't be having this conversation if the government had not allowed a, a private public uh, liquor uh, retail sector. But because the government has allowed that and certain products that come through the liquor board are allocated solely for the uh, private stores, LRSs, we're not even able to, to order them. So our only, our only avenue to these whiskeys is through purchasing at the LRS and not ordering it directly through the LDB. Which is illegal under the current policy. It's against policy. Well, <laughs> that's a, let's put it that way, yeah. <laughs> Have you been told anything regarding the status of your whiskey that was seized back in January? We have uh, acknowledgement from the government that our product is there. We have assurances from the government that nothing will happen to the 242 bottles of the rarest whiskey on earth. 
nothing will happen to that until uh, due process has been completed. Now, what due process is at this point, we don't know. Uh, since uh, supplying all the information that the provincial government has asked for through uh, the contravention notice, we have yet to hear back. So you're sort of in limbo six months after this. Yes, totally in limbo. But uh, the good thing is, the whiskey's in the whiskey. We know where it is. Well, sorry, we don't know where it is. We just know it's not being uh, has nothing's been destroyed from it. So that's good. And theoretically, all 242 bottles, if this case is dropped or you win your case, will be returned to you intact, right? We're certainly anticipating that. The bottles were all sealed uh, prior to uh, the departure of our establishment. So we're, we're hoping the government does the right thing, uh, reverses the policy, comes to us and says, you know, thank you very much for helping us with this inv- investigation. Uh, we no longer need your product as evidence in that investigation. And here you go. That's what we're hoping for. Easy walk back for them. Overall, is this a positive change or at least a positive recommendation for the industry in terms of uh, handling the way it serves retail liquor stores, the private stores, and the hospitality sector? Does this show any sign at all that uh, BC may be coming into the light, so to speak? We believe so. We don't believe that any of the recommendations from the liquor review panel uh, have, uh, none of the recommendations are out in left field, so to speak. They're all uh, very contrite, and the there are systemic problems within the liquor distribution branch and liquor control and licensing. Unfortunately, two departments supposed to be run separately are run uh, together with the same leader. And there's there's a lot of problems, right? You know, it's very difficult for us to even get our product from the LDB. Sometimes it takes six weeks to get a product that we've ordered that uh, is available. But we uh, we believe that there is great opportunity for change to happen very simply. And the uh, through the liquor review, they discussed some of the items that would take more dialogue, more consultation, will take some legislation. And the uh, Mark Hicken, who wrote the report uh, and concurring with the rest of the panel, these can come at a later date. Over time, as long as we're working towards the, uh, the end goal, then, you know, we're moving forward. As for the uh, being able to purchase from any legal licensed uh, liquor entity in the province, we think that's the easiest thing for them to, uh, to change for a policy reversal. So we think, uh, we believe that this is a really well-written report. We don't believe the government should be, I know they're not shocked with the report. They, they knew that the, some of the problems that they had, but they're mostly an easy fix. So we think it's a positive thing. The January raids came on the eve of the annual Victoria Whiskey Festival and forced the cancellation of several tastings and master classes at the festival because the samples for those tastings did not come through the provincial system, and a number of tables at the festival's grand tasting were dry for the same reason. The report also recommends a review and re-evaluation of the current policies for festivals and trade events as well. Spokesmen for British Columbia's Ministry of the Attorney General were not available for an interview in time for this episode. We'll have more on this story as it develops. In other news, Canada's new 10% import tariff on American whiskeys has now officially taken effect. Friday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government released the final list of American-made goods to be hit with tariffs in retaliation for the Trump administration's punitive tariffs on imported steel and aluminum. There was a phone call between Trudeau and U.S. President Donald Trump late Friday, Reuters reports Trudeau told Trump that Canada had no choice but to retaliate for the steel and aluminum tariffs and said they would be lifted when the U.S. removes its tariffs. The next step comes this Friday when China's 25% tariffs on American-made whiskeys and other goods takes effect. So far, the Trump administration has not yet revealed any plans to respond in kind for the retaliatory tariffs, which have also come from the European Union, Mexico, 
and turkey. Let's turn now to new whiskeys. Glen Allocky has officially unveiled the four single malts from the Speyside Distillery that will form its core range under the distillery's new ownership team led by Scotch whiskey veteran Billy Walker. He gave us a preview during our April interview in episode 690. Although it's a Speyside, it's, uh, it's, got a, it's a pretty full-bodied Speyside so it's it can it, it's journey and wood that it can take it can carry wood flavor a whole variety of wood flavors um, um, uh, in a pretty well balanced way but there'll be quite a big emphasis going forward on uh, on px and all also uh, casks from virgin wood as he told us then the range includes a 10 year old cask strength edition matured in a combination of american oak Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez sherry casks, and virgin oak. It's bottled at 57.1% ABV, and there are also new 12, 18, and 25-year-old editions. The Glenallachie whiskies will be available at first in 28 countries, including the UK, the United States, Germany, Taiwan, China, and France, with recommended retail prices ranging from 57 pounds around $75 for the 10-year-old cask strength, to £232, that's around $305, for the 25-year-old. Meanwhile, Billy Walker's former colleagues at Glendronach have released batch number 7 of Glendronach's cask strength single malt. This year's annual release is matured in a combination of Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez sherry casks and bottled at 57.9% ABV, It'll be available in limited amounts worldwide. There's no word on pricing. Jura is releasing the third and final edition in its one series of annual bottlings. One for You is an 18-year-old single malt matured in ex-bourbon barrels and finished in virgin American oak quarter casks. It's bottled at 52.5% ABV and follows the 2016 release of One for the Road and last year's One and All bottling. It'll be available in the UK, France, Germany, and Asia for around 130 pounds a bottle. That converts to around $172 US. Douglas Lang and Company is out with the second edition in its Extra Old Particular Platinum series. It's a 40-year-old single cask bottling from the old Port Dundas Grain Distillery in Glasgow. The Lang family is releasing one whiskey in this series each quarter this year to celebrate the company's 70th anniversary. This one will be available in selected markets worldwide with a recommended retail price of £350. That's around $462 a bottle. And Francis Distillery Verengem is celebrating its 20th anniversary with a new limited edition bottling. Armoric Triagos is a peated single malt matured in ex-bourbon casks. 2,000 bottles will be available worldwide, including the U.S. No details on pricing. And finally, just as we started recording this episode, we got word that one of New York City's top whiskey bars, The Dead Rabbit, suffered extensive smoke and water damage following a fire in a neighboring building Sunday morning. The bar was in the middle of a major expansion project, but is now closed until further notice. We profiled the Dead Rabbit and its namesake Irish whiskey earlier this year in episode 681. It's available in the archives at whiskeycast.com. And that's also where you can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Want to try one of the world's great whiskeys? Look for the Highland Park 18-year-old. It's been a favorite of judges in whiskey competitions around the world for years now, and it just might become one of your favorites, too. Check out the entire range at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. McTeers has its next whiskey auction coming up this Friday in Glasgow, Scotland. The Proof Washington Distillers Festival is this coming Saturday in Seattle. And you can watch from anywhere you have an internet connection as our pals the Scotch Test Dummies do their annual 12 Hours of Boom 
online tasting fest on Saturday as well. The annual Pig and Whiskey Festival takes over the street at Nine Mile Road and East Troy Street in the Detroit suburb of Ferndale, Michigan, July 13th through the 15th. The NAV Center in Cornwall, Ontario hosts its first Beer, Bourbon, Blues and Barbecue Fest on Saturday the 14th. Join us the week of July 17th through the 22nd for special coverage from this year's Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans. And for our friends in Australia, Whiskey Live Perth is July 27th and 28th, and Whiskey Live Melbourne is on August 10th and 11th. Right now, we have 211 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. We're adding new events all the time. And if you have a festival, tasting, or other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form on our website to let us know all about it. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place, and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like, I like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging Hickian Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. Oh. What is character? It's giving a damn. You're all right, lassie. Which looks like this, as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game on the telly, Ella. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cup, cup. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Scotland's Isle of Isla is a magical place on land. If you're on the water, though, the conditions can range from smooth as glass every once in a while to rough enough to make even the most seasoned sailors think twice, maybe even three times, before heading out. The rocks around Isla have claimed more than their share of shipwrecks over the decades, and while everyone who grows up on Isla learns to swim as a necessity, only a brave few ever go for a dip anywhere other than the community pool next to Beaumore Distillery. Last July... Beam Suntory brand ambassador Johnny Mundell joined veteran explorers Justin Fornell and Chad Anderson for the Great Isla Swim. Eight days swimming around the island, filling a 30-gallon cask with whiskey from each of Isla's eight distilleries. As we heard from Jason Johnstone Yellen of Single Cask Nation, during our coverage of the Whiskey Jubilee back in episode 705, the Great Isla Swim Explorers Cask Whiskey is now being sold, with all profits being donated to the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Justin Fornell told his story recently in Men's Journal, and there's a documentary being produced on the swim. But let's hear from Johnny Mundell, who joined the expedition just a few days before they hit the water. How'd you get roped into this Isla Swim thing to begin with? It was entirely the fault of Simon Brooking, and Simon had put a tweet out some years back saying, what's the most unusual place you've ever drunk Laphroaig? Justin Fornell is an exceptionally unusual character, and he had replied to that tweet saying, I drank Laphroaig after swimming the Bronx River. So that put them in touch. They then had a couple of years of back and forth coming up with ideas, and Simon, I was actually really offended by this. Simon's initial thing was, would you do a swim for us? And I was like, kind of like, Simon, why don't you just slap me in the face and ignore me like a small child? Um, but it came good in the end. Uh, well, let's explain this because you've done long distance swimming too, right? Five years ago this summer, a friend from my kid's school let me know that I was looking a little bit pudgy. And she signed me up to do a swim between Hermosa Beach Pier and Manhattan Beach Pier. And I just, I did it for the sake of doing it, but it then became this, this obsession, like just open water swimming, being out in the ocean, the changeability of the conditions, 
but what I didn't expect that it was I'd find a community doing that. So I was a rugby player from the age of four to the birth of my first child. And it wasn't just the isolation and the, the experience in the water. It was the fact that despite the isolation, you were doing it with a group of people. And I found a community very similar to what I got from a rugby club all my life. So I've been doing this for a while, and then Simon starts telling the company, I've met this great guy who's going to go and do a swim for us. I was a wee bit miffed. Uh, flash forward, these guys kept pursuing this idea. It was back and forth. Two different summers they talked about it, and eventually it was happening. Now, the reason I went on the swim is because our friends just, uh, uh, Joshua and Jason from uh, Single Cast Nation, they decided to kind of come on board as the as the whiskey coordinator. They were a, a pr the principal sponsor. Now, no no established company was ever going to finance two people going and attempting to drown themselves swimming around Isla. They did, and they brought me in as the third swimmer. So Justin and Chad were the two principal swimmers. They're both members of the Explorers Club New York. They had the harebrained scheme in, in collaboration with Simon. Joshua and Jason brought the whole thing to life by coordinating the whiskey and coming up with the idea of, like, we knew we were going to collect whiskey, but they, they gave the potential to make a bottle, which I believe you ahead of me have tried and I went along with the intention of being a, a, a cheerleader I thought I'm going to swim the first day our bag to Lafroy, three miles I can do that mentally did that swam the next day and then swam the third day and it was the it just it was a progression every day I just got up and tried to swim as far as I could and the moment I was taking the safety element away from the boat or the other swimmers taking the, the attention and making it across too big a span I was like, well, I get in the boat and I just cheer them on. That never happened. And I got to, and I got to say, I, I got to experience something that I'll never, I'll never have anything like it. I'm one of three people that swam around the coast of Isla. It's still a struggle for me to even go articulate probably what that means. It was the absolute edge. It was like tapping into my 20 year old self. Like you remove yourself from your day to day, your job, your life, your wife, your kids. I got to be in a bunk house on Isla, which I love anyway, with a bunch of guys I'd never met, trying to do this challenge that I thought was impossible. Um, everyone was along for the ride. It was just, I, 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 we all connected, we bonded, we supported each other through it. It was brutal. I, I, pain, I, physical pain lasted two months after the swim. Mental pain, it's taken me months to get over it because it was such a constant high. Um, like I just you mentally I, I, I I've never climbed mountains or done anything really extraordinary this was the closest in my life I've come to doing something that was just remarkable as an experience and the high that you get from the the moment that you're in that is like nothing else I've ever seen so what was the hardest leg to swim we all had different hard legs um, the hardest leg was always the leg you were on um, but I'll say, looking back uh, retrospectively, that was one, two, three. Two and three were, were tough. Four was bliss. It was the west coast, Port New Haven up to uh, Anclacken on the northwest corner. That was bliss. Now, what happened after four was the weather completely went to hell. We were having one of those, like, you just had it the fish. You had, like, sunshine. We were having, like, the week of sunshine that they get. So day five, we had to change direction and we had to move down to the south of the island, southwest. And the wind was coming, the wind was, the storm was just hitting the island on the northwest. We thought we'll swim the southwest leg to get a bit of shelter, but the wind was just coming off. The canoes couldn't be in the water. They were getting blown away. And that was really tough on Justin and, and Chad, both in a rough day. Um, North End was tough. My personal worst day, and also it was joyous, but was swimming the, the Sound of Jura. But I just, I got stung from my nose to my navel by jellyfish that day. And I came out of the water and I was just talking gibberish. Like I was just, I, toxins were in my body and I was just, just I was wacko. Uh, Brucladi came on the boat that day. And if you go on their YouTube channel, they actually filmed that particular day. If you look at my face as we're, as we're taking the boat back into Porasic, my eyes are away, I'm punch drunk, I look like, you know, like combination of Rocky and Apollo Creed. I am out, I'm out on my feet. Um, no memory of it at all. Like one too many drams of Isla whiskey, right? Uh, way more. I, like, I mean, I mean complete mental, no, like I remember the photographs, I don't remember the experience at all. 
and it was it was kind of sad because the water was doing like 12 knots you know how fast the sound flows so it was the longest distance we swam but without actually having to make the most amount of effort you just got swept up the channel like we've all seen the ferry boat cross between Jura and Isla going sideways like a crab flowing into the water we just went whoosh and we were past everybody that was there to watch us missed us because we passed for ASIC that quickly and I don't remember a damn thing about it let's put this in perspective how far was this swim over all the days? So we reckon the coastal distance around Isla, I've seen two different facts, but I reckon it's about 100 miles. We reckon we did 80 miles in eight days. And that is based upon, you're not swimming, you know, we didn't swim up uh, Loch Inadal, for example. Like, there was a lot of areas where you, you cut out coastal route, but we, we circumnavigated the island in eight days, and we reckon we swam about 80 miles. Have you recovered finally from yeah, this? No, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling great now. But you know when you're, so I'm a avid swimmer. I swim in Hermosa Beach. The weeks after that swim, I hated being in the water. And again, it's my place I go to to reconnect. I travel a lot and I meet a lot of people. You give a lot of energy in this job. Swimming has become my way of like recharging what I need to go out and do my job. You know yourself, you're, you're, we're always out, we're always, we're hosts, we're guides for these brands in the, in the minds of the customer. So swimming was this place I went to to like get the energy I needed to go back out and do my job. The, the saddest thing for me, and I, I, I was really worried in the moment, I thought I would never want to swim again. I was in the water in California just going, this is miserable physically and emotionally, you're just looking at the place going, it's not Isla. Like seeing Isla, from the water level across the whole coast is like nothing, nothing else. I've seen every every mile of that island, the caves, um, the rocks, uh, the wildlife was incredible. I've gotten, I've, I've definitely gotten past it, but it took me months to like be appreciative of swimming in California again after having experienced it in Isla. The whiskey is being used for a very good cause to raise money for the lifeboats and uh, Fortunately, you guys did not have to rely on the lifeboat crews, did you? Well, we had them. They joined us out on day seven. They came along in a little one of their smaller boats just to come and experience a little bit. Lifeboats are always going to be one of the most critical factors for island life. It doesn't matter whether you make a living out on the water or you're just using the water as transport to and from any of the islands. You grow up in the UK constantly being aware of amazing fundraising efforts that benefit the lifeboats. It was the greatest privilege of the project that that's what we were we were supporting. If you think about all the conversation going on around Isla right now, about the resources generated by the island and where perhaps those resources are being channeled into, it was really good to see something whiskey related that was solely intended to raise money for those lifeboats and, and the great work they do. And ironically, my cousin works on volunteers on one of the boats. So he was out with us as well, which was really magical. Would you do it again? I'm going to tell you right now, I plan to. Um, won't say any more about that right now, but I, I plan to. When Justin Fornal and Chad Anderson came up with the idea of swimming around Isla, their original plan was to take turns pulling that 30-gallon cask of whiskey chained to their backs during the swim. They did pull it a few times during the eight days, but the cask spent most of the expedition on the boat, for safety's sake. As Fornal wrote in his Men's Journal article, to lose a swimmer would be bad. To lose the whiskey would be unacceptable. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the classic 16-year-old Lagavulin, the Distiller's Edition, and the throwback 8-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And as I mentioned earlier, Single Cask Nation is selling the Great Isla Swim Explorer's Cask Blended Malt. The swimmers collected whiskeys between 10 and 23 years old from the eight Isla distilleries in that 30-gallon cask. 
it was left to rest and marry for nine months following the expedition. Only 145 bottles were produced, and they're selling for $500 each. Once again, all proceeds are being donated to the RNLI. I did receive a sample, though, from the folks at Single Cask Nation. It's bottled at 59.4% ABV. The nose is earthy with a rich peatiness and hints of driftwood smoke, along with a subtle tartness of green apples and grilled pineapple, and touches of fig cookies and dates in the background that add even more complexity. The taste is oily and thick with great peat smokiness and spices, but well-balanced with touches of baked fruits, hints of toffee, and a nice maltiness. The finish is long and gentle with touches of driftwood smoke, peat, and dried fruits. It's an outstanding whiskey that reflects the work that went into the Great Isla Swim expedition, and I'm scoring it a 95. I mentioned the new Russell's Reserve 2002 vintage bourbon from Wild Turkey last time around, and the Whiskey Ferry delivered a sample the other day. Eddie Russell blended 25 barrels from 2002 together to create this one, and at 57.3% ABV, it's the first barrel-proof Russell's Reserve that is not a single-barrel bottling. The nose has notes of peach pie, pears, oak, a slight pepperiness, and a touch of grilled pineapple. The taste is thick and mouth-coating with white pepper and a slight citrusy tartness, along with brown sugar, cocoa beans, and just a hint of oak. The finish is long and smooth, with lingering spices and touches of cooked bananas and toasted coconut. I'm scoring the Russell's Reserve 2002 Vintage a 94. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, Proud to announce a new grain-to-glass project where proprietary seed and unique mash bills re-examine the variables that go into making whiskey. See more at heavenhilldistillery.com slash blog. Think wisely, drink wisely. Let's look now at a couple of new rye whiskeys. New York's Copper Sea Distilling put its new bottled-and-bond version of Bontecu Crag Rye Whiskey on sale this weekend at the distillery, and I received a sample the other day. It's one of the whiskeys that qualifies for Empire Rye status because it's made with New York State-grown rye, and of course, like all bottled and bond whiskeys, it's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose is warm and aromatic with good rye spices, including clove, ginger, and just a hint of dill, along with vanilla, honey, and charred oak. The taste is spicy and well-balanced with clove, black pepper, ginger, honey, charred oak, and just a slight hint of lemony tartness that develops later and continues through the finish, which is long with that touch of tartness and solid spices that fade away nicely. I'm scoring Copper Sea Distilling's Bontecu Crag Bottled in Bond Rye a 92. Virginia's Catoctin Creek Distillery did something unusual with its Roundstone Rye Whiskey recently, finishing some in a single hickory syrup barrel for sale exclusively at the distillery. They arranged to get me a sample via a whiskey ferry delivery, and as with the regular Roundstone Rye, it's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose, though, has a good balance of oak and hickory notes with a barbecue sauce tanginess, along with hints of brown sugar, honey, and muted spices. The taste is thick and chewy, and the spices kick in from the start with black pepper and cinnamon notes that fade slowly to reveal sweeter touches of honey, molasses, and butterscotch candies, along with an aromatic touch of anise that comes out late and leads through the finish. That finish is long with the anise, butterscotch, a hint of linseed oil, and muted spices. I'm scoring Catoctin Creek's Roundstone Rye Hickory Syrup Finish, an 89. And finally, it's been hot the last few days here in New Jersey, with afternoon temperatures in the mid to upper 90s. There's also a record heat wave in Ireland and the UK, along with the usual summer heat and humidity in a lot of other places. 
So, it's time for another one of my semi-annual reviews of whiskey-flavored ice creams. In the past, I've reviewed Ben & Jerry's Urban Bourbon and Jenny's Middle West Whiskey and Pecans ice cream. I was at the supermarket the other day looking through the freezer section and found High Road's Bourbon Burnt Sugar ice cream. High Road is based in Georgia, but uses Kentucky bourbon along with bourbon vanilla and a bit of sorghum syrup in this ice cream. And when I saw all that, I had to grab a pint. Of course, there is no alcoholic strength listed on the label, but the nose is cold and creamy with a whiff of bourbon and vanilla. The taste starts off with vanilla and a bit of brown sugar sweetness at first, but the bourbon comes alive with a nice flavor right after that and sticks around through the finish with lingering bourbon and vanilla notes. I paid $4.99 for a pint, and that's a better price than either the Ben & Jerry's or the Jenny's whiskey ice creams. While I'll never go through an entire bottle of whiskey while doing tasting notes, I just about killed off that pint of High Road. I'd buy it again, and for that reason, I'm scoring High Road's Bourbon Burnt Sugar Ice Cream a 94. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, and I'll be adding these whiskeys and the ice cream to our searchable list of more than 2,200 tasting notes at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Listeo. Carrying Redbreast trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeo Edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Time now for your voice, brought to you by Lot 40. David McDonald of Orlando, Florida, asked this question the other day on Twitter. After listening to you talk about the Redbreast special release going to members of their fan club, I was wondering, are there other similar lists I should join from other brands? Well, there are a lot of those affinity groups, and the best way to find them is to check the website for the whiskey brands you like. For instance, in addition to Redbreast's The Birdhouse, Highland Park has its Inner Circle, Isle of Arran has the White Stags, Jura has the Jurox, Springbank has its Springbank Society, and Ardbeg's Committee is one of the largest with members all over the world. In the U.S., Maker's Mark has its Ambassadors program, and even if they don't have a formal club, a lot of distilleries maintain a mailing list where they offer details on special bottlings and distillery events. There is one drawback, though, if you live in the U.S. You might not be able to take advantage of many of the club-only bottlings, since distilleries outside the U.S. are not openly able, for the most part, to ship directly to U.S. residents. Ardbeg is one of the rare distilleries that makes its annual committee bottling available through U.S. retailers, but those bottles are generally available to anyone, not just committee members. Bobby Parnell tweeted this from Texas the other day. Have you ever run across a bottle that you just know should be good and should have a lot going on in the glass, and you're the only guy in the room just not getting it? Whatever the expression, it happens to me with Kalila, and I just can't figure it out. I love complex, rich, earthy, and peaty scotch. The Kalila should fit that bill. For some reason, it just doesn't for me. Bobby, there's nothing wrong with your senses. Each one of us has our own unique senses of smell and taste, and there is certainly nothing wrong with not getting a specific whiskey. It might be worth changing things up a bit from your usual tasting routine, though. Maybe try a different style of glass or add a bit of water and see if that makes a difference. But if it doesn't, relax. There are hundreds of other whiskeys out there that you can enjoy. McW, at Mr. McW on Twitter, asked this question. Any word on what happened at Barton then? Warehouse was reported to be under construction, but it was still well short of the 100-year mark. Well, there's no word yet. 
on what actually caused the partial collapse of that rickhouse on June 22nd. Engineers are still trying to get the rest of the warehouse shored up and secure before any of the barrels from the collapsed side are moved. We do know that there was some form of repair work going on at that warehouse before it collapsed, but Sazerac has not disclosed any details. Busick Construction is the go-to contractor for work on rickhouses in Kentucky, as well as other distilleries around the country. I did exchange emails with Busick President Donald Blinko this week, and he cannot discuss specifics about the Barton 1792 collapse because of a contract with Sazerac, but he did confirm a couple of things we mentioned on last weekend's episode during Behind the Label. Under normal conditions, wooden warehouses can last more than 100 years when properly maintained and kept dry. And while some distilleries do use metal racks in their rickhouses, he has seen them have to be replaced a lot sooner than that because of rust. We'll continue to follow that story as new developments happen. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always post it on the Your Voice page at whiskeycast.com. We're also available on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. And the email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. A quick program note now. When we started doing two episodes a week back in April, I did mention that there would be times during the year when we'd only do one show a week. And with the Independence Day holiday coming up this week, this is going to be one of those weeks. We won't have our midweek episode this week that usually comes out on Wednesday nights or Thursdays. So we'll go back to our old schedule, this episode, and then a new one this coming weekend. And after that, we'll get back to two shows a week. Behind the Label is our look at the science, history, and other things that make whiskey unique. And this time around, we're going to stray just a little bit. With the Independence Day holiday this week and a lot of people planning cookouts during the summer... I thought it might be good to share one of our family's whiskey-related grilling recipes with you. We do what we like to call drunken tenderloin. In the morning, you take a beef or a pork tenderloin and a cup, cup and a half, maybe two cups of whiskey, the one of your choice. You put the meat into a bowl or a plastic container and then pour the whiskey over the top. Cover the container and then stick it in the refrigerator for the day until it's grilling time. During that time... The whiskey is soaking into the meat. And by the way, this does work with salmon fillets too. Here's the science part. The alcohol in the whiskey helps break down the muscle fibers in the meat and make that tenderloin even more tender while adding flavor at the same time. And this is one of the benefits of cooking with whiskey compared to a lot of wines. The higher alcohol level works faster in tenderizing the meat. At the end of the day, take the tenderloin and put it on a hot grill. When it's done cooking all the way through, put it on a plate and let it rest for a few minutes, then serve. And by the way, if you do go the salmon route, put the filet on a wet cedar grilling plank or a piece of aluminum foil before you grill it. Since the skin on the salmon filet is thin, you don't want it sticking to the grill and falling apart. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. That's also where you'll find links for our WhiskeyCast HD videos and the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast brought to you by the Whiskey Exchange. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, events, cocktail recipes, and much more, including a complete archive of all of our past episodes all the way back to 2005. Our Cask Strength Conversation continues all week long online. You'll find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. This is Whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. 
Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know know Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you twice each week from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.